Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hello. My name is uh, Wally Grudowski. I'm Wally Be Good on Pinside, um, and this is a seminar about building pins from scratch. This is my son, Walt. He's going to run the video for us. It's hard for me to do two things at the same time. It all began for me in the fall of 2010, and at that time, nobody had really attempted to build a WPC from scratch. So posts would come up frequently on RGP about the feasibility. Medieval Madness was always a prime candidate because of the rarity and the gameplay. I had just completed a minor restoration in a funhouse, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, I kind of fell in love with it. So I decided to take on building the Medieval Madness from parts. It took about a year to finish. Uh, I did a, a Medieval Madness seminar at the 2012 Pinball Expo. Kind of hard to believe it's been 12 years. I still have the, uh, the speaker tag from 2012. Uh, since then, I've built an attack from Mars, a Cactus Canyon, a Monster Bash, a Scared Stiff, an Adams Family, and most recently, an Indiana Jones. <coughs> I began each project the same way by first downloading the game manual and parts list from the Internet Pinball Database and then start looking for parts. These parts lists, sometimes called the BOM, Bill of Materials, are typically about 2,500 lines long. Uh, WPC and WPC95 schematics are also available to download. I would modify the parts list, excluding hardware like screws and nuts and washers and consolidate the one-line generic easy-to-buy assemblies like flippers, and I would end up with about 300 lines of parts to find. I found quite a few errors in the manuals, but never on the parts list. Often I was building one pin and searching for parts for the next one. It seemed like if a, if a part broke easily, it would be reproduced by someone and available. But the ones that seldom broke, those were the really tough ones to find. So this is an example of the section of the parts list that details the scared stiff diverter assembly. Williams used a .2 prefix to indicate major assemblies and then used higher prefixes to in designate sub-assemblies in every individual component right down to the exact screw and rivets required. It, this can also be helpful when looking for parts because while an assembly might not be available, the components that make it up could be. Also, in most cases, it's less expensive to buy individual components and assemble them rather than buying a complete assembly. So if you look at this parts list over here, and you go, uh, you, you get to the point two prefix, and that always indicates either a major assembly or a discrete part on the play field. And if you look at this one that's with the diverter, you can go down here and say there's a one part over here that's called an assembly, uh, Let's let's say let's say right around here somewhere. If uh, if an assembly isn't available, the component parts that make up that subassembly might be available. So you can search for you might if if a part is just obsolete, you might be able to find the parts that make up that assembly. That's why you know it would have been tough to make these machines if I wouldn't have had the parts list. And if somebody, I don't know who, downloaded all these parts lists on the Internet Pinball database, but they're all available out there to find. Let me turn this off before I blame myself over here. This is the assembly drawing in the manual for the same scared stiff diverter from the parts list. There are also parts lookup databases on Pinball Life's website and on Planetary's websites 
that allow you to ver verify the total number of each part needed and also to cross check parts from other pinball machines. This early one written by Oven Mall, for example, could be used to determine the total number of sheet metal screws required for a game searching under sheet metal screw. So you go to this, uh, you go to this database and you plug in over here searching under sheet metal screw and click on scared stuff and up pops all the sheet metal screws that are used in that particular game and a number. Now you can also click on another machine at the same time and find out which part is available from another machine. Uh, it really helps out sometimes because back when I was building uh, machines from uh, converting NBA fast breaks, some of the NBA fast break lamp boards were the same ones used in Medieval Madness. So you can substitute and you can cross-reference and find out and find that out from the parts list. Uh, <coughs> WPC catalogs are also available on the planetary website. Those can also be used for uh, part identification. You can see on this one here, some of the ball guides are hard to find. It's hard to find a part number. And when you're looking for parts, you got to look for part. You got to have the part number. That's how you. That's how you find parts. Uh, if you look at this catalog, it'll list the ball guide and the part number of that ball guide. Sometimes it was possible to substitute or modify an existing part from a different pin. I substituted a Circus Voltaire diverter bracket for the Indiana Jones bracket that was unavailable at the time. I modified a fast break ramp to fit the scared stiff subway. I converted the Medieval Madness Castle bracket to work as an AFM alien bracket by adding a small section. Or, or this part, this Indiana Jones part, was made by bending a bracket and attaching a section from a defender arm. Sometimes all a part needed was a little grinding to convert it to another. I bought quite a few parts at pinball shows, just like this. There's always a nice, there was always a nice assortment of new and used parts, usually at discounted prices. Parts that I would always end up buying new were the ones readily seen, like the cabin head decals, above play field parts like the plastics and the posts, the trans lights and the stainless steel side rails. I, <clears throat> I have also restored many used parts, such as the coin door, targets, other under play field mechanisms. Brian Kelly has a nice YouTube video on restoring coin doors, and I have that in the uh, in the back in a link section too. I used a small ultrasonic cleaner with simple green solution, vibrating tumbler with walnut shells and flits to clean and polish. Many of these used under play field parts would turn out like brand new. I was able to find some very reasonable used parts for Adam's family on pin side. Uh, the bookcase parts were in uh, pretty rough condition, but everything cleaned up well after the ultrasonic and polishing. Uh, lately, I've been using Eastwood Silver CAD Spray. It comes in a rattle can. It really brightens up used parts. This is a used scoop from Adam's family, which has been sprayed with Silver CAD. This is a used Indiana Jones subway trough, the same part after cleaning, polishing, and painting with silver cad. Uh, new parts are sweet, but taking old beat up ones and bringing them back to life is really rewarding. While searching, I would determine which parts would need fabrication. There were some, a few complex weldments that Harry Stair from Mantis Amusement reproduced. I would bring him an original that I borrowed and he would reverse engineer it with his fabricator. This is the Indiana Jones ball popper. There were some Indiana, Indiana Jones parts that I fabbed from polycarbonate or from acrylics. I used a small table jigsaw for cutting. This plastic ball deflector 
was bent using a heat gun and brake and hand tools. This is a small polycarbonate bracket for the Indiana Jones plane support, again, just by bending by heating and hand tools. And here it is located near the, uh, the tail of the uh, plane. This bracket protects some Indiana Jones switches. Uh, epoxy was used to attach metal collars to plastics. These are some plastics from Adam's family cut from polycarbonate angle. And I use bits designed specifically for, dr for drilling plastics. They have a real sharp point, they drill plastic real easy. Then that part was riveted to the plastic. And um, also the Indiana Jones backboard was cut from acrylic. I made unavailable wire gates by bending piano wire with hand tools and wire ball guides with eighth inch rod. This is a wire bending tool that I used on some. I also made hex posts that were not available using one quarter inch and three eighths inch hex stack that was first cut to the proper length, then drilled and tapped on each end. I made a jig to locate the center. Screws were added and the heads cut off for threaded sections if needed. Stay arms were made using bar stock and plastic dip. And I, <clears throat> I used a drill set up like a lathe and a dremel to make various shafts that were not available. The small cutoff wheel makes nice grooves for the eclipse. Some parts were found on Amazon, like the Scared Stiff Spider. Not original, but kind of look okay. Occasionally, a plastic would need to be made. I would scan, print on clear decal paper, attach to acrylic, and cut. <clears throat> For the first couple pins, I used NBA fast breaks as donors. They really had some hard to find parts back then, like the speaker panel, apron, cab harness, power transformer, and just a lot of other generic parts like the coin door, slings, jet bumpers, ball trough, auto launch and flippers, not to mention a complete board set, cab and head. Some parts like this were modified, like the back box uh, light panel. This was, it was back in the day when you could buy fast brakes for $1,200. When the price tripled on fast brakes and the parts situation greatly improved in the last couple of years, it was really no longer necessary or cost effective to do. <clears throat> parts that would almost always need fabrication would be most ball guys and some brackets. I spent a lot of hours making those. Once in a while, I get lucky and find a few. I would carefully measure the original ball guides. My sketches would then be converted into flat sheet metal drawings. <clears throat> As metal is bent, the outer material stretches so that it's necessary to use inside dimensions. It's usually easiest to measure a part, a part on the outer dimensions, so you have to convert it to inside dimensions, converting it for the metal thickness. Some required many measurements. It helped if there was a pin nearby where the owner didn't mind to have the hood popped up for some measurements. No matter how many photos you see on the internet, there's, it always comes to the point where you, you need to look at one close up. Uh, stainless parts were then laser cut from the CAD drawings. One of my local uh, pinball pals, Dino, cut many of the parts at his shop. It's become a lot easier with the advent of companies like Sun Cut Send, who do laser cutting on small jobs. All you do is download the drawings, and boom, you get the parts in the mail in a couple days. Most pieces need to be bent. I used 18 inch and 36 inch Harbor Freight uh, bench brakes and a five inch uh, vice brake. The curves were hand belt bent using the clamps and round stack. Some guys were pretty easy, requ requiring only bends for the mounting tabs. I added small notches to the drawings to help with the bends. 
So if you notice then, I got this thing in my my break in my basement. And when I when I drew this out and or when I put it on the, on the CAD drawing, I made little notches over here that you can see. So that when you bend over the tab, the tab and the tab and the uh, bottom of the guide are flat right to the play field. So I did add a little extra things to some of the drawings to make bending or make it easier for me. I use this uh, small vise to bend tabs. It has very square faces that are not serrated so that it wouldn't mar the finish. The tabs were bent simply by using a piece of bar stock to hammer, hammer the tabs over. Others were a little bit more complicated, like this Indiana Jones part. This is the second bend, and this is the third bend, and then a, a template check. Where threaded posts were needed, I drilled and tapped the stainless for a number eight, large diameter, low profile, low profile truss head screw. The stainless actually provides a really strong fit with only a few engaging threads. When curved sections were needed, I used a brass round stock to form the radius and then check against the full, si a full size template. Where spade bolts were required, I attached with a rivet press. And for the most more complicated ones, the bending brake and the vice brake were both used. This is the first section is bent in the bench brake. The next section of this assembly is placed. Oh wait, okay. Let me see if I got this right. Yeah, the most complicated might re might require bending two pieces and then attaching them. So the next section is placed in the bench brake and bent. Then it is checked against the template or drawing. I would scribe lines on the metal with fine tip marker where the bends were to be made. Then it's moved back over to the vice brake and the next bend is made. I needed to bend in the correct sequence so that the part would subsequently fit back into the brake. The next bend is made by repositioning the piece in the vice brake and then making the bend. The final bend is made by moving back to the bench brake and then making the bend. And then a quick template check. The two sections were then attached by drilling holes and riveting. I would always drill the holes rather than include the holes on my drawings to take in, into any account any small variations when I, bend, when I be, would bend the metal. I wanted the rivets to fit exact and I wanted them to fit real tight. The, my final part is a little bit different than the original with me using the rivets instead of uh, uh, the original would have been spot welded. Uh, the outer ball guides were best bent right on the play field, just using the key lines and the play field dimples. Sometimes I modified a guide slightly like, these, like this outer ball guide to help maintain a proper height from the play field. Like I was telling you uh, in that other photo where I made the little notches, and this one here, and this ball guide, this, the original, he had just like a tapered post that would come down here into the play field. So what I did is when I drew it, I drew this section here so that this would hit flat on the play field and maintain this difference. Um, I, I've had problems with other ones where it's just a tapered post and it's hard to maintain the right height from the play field. So I added that small section just to maintain that. Uh, <clears throat> these are some of the completed Indiana Jones ball guys. Uh, parts were cut from 18 gauge stainless, like most of the originals, but I had one or two cut from 22 gauge to make the bending a little bit easier. This ramp from Indiana Jones 
was cut from 22 gauge because I knew that it would be difficult for me to bend it if it was an 18 gauge and with my hand brakes. Likewise, some parts, like for the Indiana Jones opto brackets, they were originally thicker than 18 gauge. But I would use 18 gauge again to make the bending easier for me. These are the same opto brackets installed on the lock assembly for Indiana Jones. I repurposed uh, NBA fast break cabinets for the first pins. Cabinets were typically in remarkable condition, usually not routed too much. I removed the existing arc with heat gun and scraper and any remaining adhesive removed with orange powder. The last several cabinets were made by Bill Webb or Paul at Virtua Pin. Bonded and sanded until I got a smooth finish Use the random orbital sander, starting with 80 grit, moving to 150, and finishing off with 220 grit, and then prime. Originally, I would use the uh, wet method for a decal uh, for the side art. And then I progressed to the dry method, and the results are much, much better doing it dry. Uh, Jim McCune has a really great YouTube video on this process. Anybody could do it. I purchased a set of screens for printing. Uh, the patent text was screen printed on the cab. The warning text was screen printed on the back boxes. And there's several really good YouTube videos on this process also. Wooden parts that had to be made included the side rails, back panels, skid runners, and some insert panels. I typically use pine for the backboards poplar for the side rails, and oak for the skids. MDF was used for the insert panels on Scared Stiff, Adams Family, and Indiana Jones. Templates of the originals were transferred and cut using hole saws, Forstner bits, and a hand jigsaw. Some backboards required a decal. The wire ramps or habit rails were always tough to find. There were some NOS ones at, at shows like this and at Pinball Spare Parts Australia. Some were found on eBay or Pinside. Uh, Davey from Pinside made these Indiana Jones uh, wire forms for me. For Medieval Madness and Attack from Mars, I came across a rolling ball sculptor in California through an internet search. And I, <clears throat> I sent them some photos and he was confident that he could duplicate the, those habit trails if I sent him the originals. These are some photos of the ramps in his shop. I built some boards for the last few pins, and, uh, nothing like the smell of soldering in the morning. Uh, the red ones are ones from uh, bare, boards, bare boards that I, bare boards, that I bought from uh, Victor Tan on Pinside. While looking for parts, I would make a few drawings, such as this for the lamp location, to make assembly easier, easier later on. Another drawing would be the GI location and how they were wired. And connectors, uh, <clears throat> a diagram of where connectors would pass from the bottom of the play field to switches and lamps on the top side. I, <clears throat> I would only start assembly and wiring after collecting all the parts and building all the mechs. These are some of the wiring tools that I used. Auto wire stripper, flush cutter, Molex extractors and crimpers, and IDC punch down aids. I'm kind of partial to the Walden crimpers. It just seems like it gives me a little bit more control. I hold a pin in the crimper, insert the wire, and then crimp. Wires were spliced using the traditional Western Union technique and then soldered. Wire to <clears throat> wire, wire splice on the top and pigtail or Y splice on the bottom. Heat shrink tubing was used over all the solder joints. A uh, little bit of trivia, there's about 2,000 feet of, of wiring in a typical WC, WPC pin. And I, you know, I was talking to Pad Lawler in the hall and I was <coughs> asking him how, about, about, how about, about how 
how many parts there were in machining. And he says, you can figure around 1,200 parts if you don't count transistors and things like that. I recommend uh, ro the Molex connectors with the trifurcan pins for all high current power supply. IDC connectors can be used for others. There is a lot of information about connectors on Clay Harrell's site, pinrepair.com. It's got a whole section on connectors. When, <clears throat> when high current needed to be split between two header pins, Williams would use pass-through IDC connectors in a loop shown on the left. I recommend a, a Y splice with the Molex connectors and Trifurcan pins is shown on the right. When, the <clears throat> when daisy chaining wires to connectors, William <clears throat> Williams would crimp two wires to a single pin. <clears throat> Again, I would recommend the Y splice instead. Although, <clears throat> although it is possible to crimp two wires to one pin, it's difficult to get a good crimp with hand tools and it's not really recommended by Molex. Color stripe wire in short lengths is now available through Planetary, Wirebot, and Pinball Life. Originally, I would stripe my own using a tool that my son Walt made. The wires pull through a hole in the black when a paint pen, while a paint pen at 90 degrees with a little pressure from a rubber man puts the stripe on. It's not spiral, but it's, it's functional. I would always begin assembly with the back box first, installing all boards and brackets, and then proceed to board to board wiring. This is a, this is a small 5 volt DC and 12 volt DC supply harness between boards. It's wired by following the pinout header, doing one pin at a time. The header pinout is probably the most important resource when wiring and the header pinouts are located in the manuals. <coughs> Excuse me. It lists the wire color and the stripe color for each position and each header and where it terminates. Nearly every board has a pinout in the manual. For those that didn't, and there's a few, I just made it from schematics or photos. So the J101 is a header on the WPC95 driver board for this, this small power harness. Pin 1 is shown, has the gray-green wire which runs the J210 pin 7 on the MPU and J606 pin 7 on the AV board. Conversely, the J210 pin number 7 on the MPU indicates the same wire coming from J0101 pin 1 on the driver board. After all the back box board to board wiring was complete, I would wire the speaker panel again by following the pinouts, wiring diagrams, and photos of the originals. The secondary harness is next. This provides the AC power from the transformer to the back box boards. It's wired the same way using the three header pinouts on the driver board. This is the schematic for the secondary harness, which also shows the same header pinouts. The parts list for this harness contains a lot of information and even has the, has the, the length of the wire listed in inches. Now, <clears throat> I talk about the importance of part lists all the time, but in this one here, you see it starts with a point two that indicates a major, major uh, assembly, and this is the secondary harness. It lists all, all the, even the wire over here, like the red wire, it's like uh, 180 inches, if I can read that right. But it, <clears throat> it lists it all, and it lists the lengths of the wire in inches that is made up, uh, that the harness is made up of. And also, it'll even list things like what pin, you know, what what connectors are being used. And if you look in the description in the parts list embedded is the Molex part number. So you got the Molex part number right in the description of that particular uh, connector. Uh, <clears throat> the power box is then assembled using the schematic and photos. 
I would always check transformer AC voltages at this point, especially if I bought a used one. This is the back box with the secondary harness installed. I would then build up the remainder of the cab wiring using the associated wire, the uh, five header pinouts. On WPC95s, this will include two headers on the MPU board for switches, one on the AV board for cab speaker, two on the driver board for the uh, 12 volts and for the lamps. Most wiring ends up at the coin door interface board. A wire bot, a company, makes, that, makes this complete generic cab harness right now. I would then test the DMD and sound with either the back box attached to the cab or sometimes separate. The next step would be connecting wires to the remaining back, board, back box board headers that would end up going to the flippers, lamps, switches, solenoids, and flashers. Depending on how many were used in the game, up to 90 wires could then leave the head for the play field. I would leave about a 10 foot length for lamp, switch, and DC power wiring because those would usually be daisy chained or, or spliced. The exact solenoid and flash wire, on the other hand, you could look up in the parts list and find the exact length that you need and cut that wire for the exact length. I've tried a few assembly methods or techniques and I've kind of settled on this one. I have a rectangular pub table in my basement, about the same size as a play field, that puts the play field around four feet from the, from the floor. And I attach the T-nuts first. Then I flip, I flip the play field, I don't flip, I flip the play, play field and install the lowest level play field parts, which include, include the guides, the posts, jet bumper bodies, wood rails. I, like, <clears throat> I really like working on a stable sur and solid surface when installing the lower level parts and when doing the soldering. The play field moves and flexes a little bit too much for me when it's on a, on a rotisserie, but I, <clears throat> I will switch to the rotisserie later on in the build. After installing the lowest level play field parts, I turn the play field over again and rest it on blocks. The general illumination sockets are then installed and the jet bumper leads are stapled. The GI sockets are daisy chained with 22 gauge wiring using my GI location chart. Uh, <coughs> daisy chaining the lamp sockets is straightforward because two wires fit well on one tab. Then the remaining sockets, switches, the harness standoffs and the printed circuit boards are installed. Each socket and switch is ID'd with its matrix number. Using my notes for connectors that I've, that I've made previously, passing through the play field, I also ID all the play field holes, holes where the <coughs> lamp and switch connectors that pass from the bottom of the play field to the top of the play field go. This is all to help me later on when I'm doing the wiring so I, you know, I, I know where every switch and lamp is uh, on the play field. All lamp board IDCs are ID'd for the wire colors. Then I place the head near the play field and then the, uh, the entire harness consisting of the 90 odd wires is attached to the first standoff. My, <clears throat> my harness ends up a little shorter than the original Williams design. Uh, <clears throat> I just make it long enough so that the play field can sit adjacent to the cab for testing and adjustments. I usually don't end up with the big loop of wiring that you see on originals. <clears throat> I wire the general illumination power first. Since it is 18 gauge, it gives a little bit more foundation to the harness. This is the brown and the white brown wires from the driver board attached to a previously daisy chain group of sockets. Velcro, Velcro strips hold it in position. The, re <coughs> the remaining GI circuits are soldered for my GI diagram and header pinouts on the driver board. And this is the completed GI wiring.
The feature lamp harness is next after the general illumination. These are the red and yellow 22 gauge wires from the driver board. Feature lamps and switches are wired in eight by eight matrices. This essentially means that there's only 16 wires, lamp wires, that leave the driver board to control up to 64 lamps. It's done with quite a bit of da wire daisy chaining. I would use IDC connectors for lamps and switches. It's important to use the correct IDC. There are ones specific for 18 gauge and 22 gauge. There are also ones that are designed for pass through wiring. This is a tool that I made to hold the connector steady while pushing down wires. It's likewise important to use the correct push down tool. I really don't care to push down the wires when the connector is on the printed circuit board. It seems like it flexes the board too much when I'm trying to apply pressure. A matrix chart are the most important resource when wiring the feature lamps and switches. They show the color of the wire and the stripe attached to each. These are the row one feature lamps that need to be connected with the red wire with the brown stripe. Most pinball companies, they assemble the harnesses using a continuous loop of wiring when daisy chaining. It's no doubt the fastest way to manufacture a harness. This is how Williams would have run that, <coughs> that same red-brown wire so that it connects to all the lamps in row one. I would take one wire at a time and determine my own route, which might be a little bit different from the original. I would use splices to minimize wire and to make connections cleaner. Each wire, and I also had a lot of time to do it too, each wire in each wire in all the rolls would be install, installed the same way. I would use pass-through IDC connectors sometimes when daisy chaining lamp boards. Uh, lamps, the lamp sockets are simple to daisy chain because, like I mentioned before, two wires fit well on a single tab. It doesn't matter which order the wire takes, just so that it hits all the lamps in that row or column. After all the red wires, red row wires are wired, the yellow wire columns would be next. These are, these are the lamps to be connected to column one, yellow wire with brown stripe. The wiring is simplified a bit when multiple lamps are on one lamp board. One row or column wire can connect to many lamps by attaching to one single connector position on the lamp board. Next, <clears throat> next is the switch wiring. These are the green and white wires from the MPU. Installed the same way as the lamps, one row and one column at a time, following the color code on the switch matrix chart. Harnesses are temporarily held in place the same way using Velcros, Velcro strips and clothes pins. And later on, it'll be, I'll zip tie everything. <clears throat> Each lamp in each switch in the matrix has an associated diode. It may be located on the lamp socket, the switch, the lamp board, the coin door inter interface board, or in line with the wiring. It's imperative that the band be positioned correctly. When the lamps are completed, each will have a red and yellow wire connected, and each switch will have a green and white wire connected. And they must be soldered on the correct tab. I use quick connect crimp terminals on the switches as Williams did on the originals. They simplify daisy chaining because two wires can be soldered together and crimped into one terminal easily. They also help insulate the close tabs on the switch. Lastly, I would wire up the insert panel using the header pinouts. Some were relatively easy, only having GI and a few flashers. Others would require would have feature lamps and motors. And photos of the originals were very helpful here because the manuals usually do not typically have good insert panel drawings. After it, each harness was completed, I would test, sometimes by firing up the head and other times with just a continuity check. The next would be the solenoid harness, wired, together, wired using the header pinouts again, along with the black diagram, 
and a solenoid cable. I install flippers, slings, and other mechs at this tank. They would just get in my way when soldering the lamps and switches. So I install those last. I use the uh, WPC 95 color codes for high power and flippers in the Adams Family and Indiana Jones. I would use Molex connectors and solenoids and to attach to upper play field switches and lamps. The last harness would always be the optos. The primary wiring resource for the opto board is again the pinouts, header pinouts in the manual. The opto harness typically has the gray and orange wires with tracers along with the 12 volts DC. Sometimes I would relocate an under play field opto board to simplify wiring. Last, I would place the play field in the rotisserie for the pl final play field assembly and adjustments. Plastics, the wire ramps, plastic ramps, metal ramps, and backboard are installed now. I did make a few modifications to the originals. Um, I converted the uh, Adams Family play field support, play field support to the stern slide out system. Uh, which makes adjustments and repairs much easier. It's kind of a tight fit, but you can you can fit it in there on Adams Family. I have backlit plastics that were not included on in the originals, you know, like these on Medieval Madness and Indiana Jones. And I added LEDs to the skull pile on Scared Stiff. Or I added uh, chains to the drawbridge on Medieval Madness and backlit Merlin. Uh, <clears throat> all of all of photos of my pins are available on my OneDrive account, and the links are available through Pinside. All my posts start off. There's one more MM. There's one more AFM. There's one more Cactus Canyon. Um, I usually have around 500 assembly photos of of the of each pin on my OneDrive also. So. Uh, if you look at those links. Uh, <clears throat> if I found any wiring uh, errors in the manuals, I would include those in my in my notes or in my pin, pin side posts. Uh, for most pinball machines that I've built, I would say, yeah, I don't keep real good track of costs, but probably somewhere between five and six thousand dollars invested in each one, probably a thousand hours worth of labor. Uh, you know what? I love every aspect of this hobby, from deciphering the parts list, to looking for parts, to sanding, to painting, making parts that aren't available, building the wire harnesses, bending metal, everything. And to top it off, I've met some really good pinheads along the way. <clears throat> big, big thanks go out to the vendors who make all these parts available. Terry at Pinball Life, Planetary Pinball, Pinball Spare Parts Australia, Mantis, Marco, Pinball Inc., Fantasy Starship, Wirebot, Pinball Resource, Mirko, Classic Arcade, Mr. Pinball Australia. Also, also big thanks to all everybody who posts restorations, tips and photos and ideas on Pinside, PinWiki, and YouTube. And a special mention to Chris at HEP for his wonderful photo gallery of past restorations in all of his excellent YouTube videos. Uh, and not to say that, saving for the last, <laughs> none of this would be possible without the extremely des talented designers and engineers that originally built these, that originally built and designed these machines. Uh, it just wouldn't be possible. The George Gomez's, the Brian Eddy's, the Pat Lawler's, the Mark Ritchie's, Dennis Norman, Matt Coriel, Lyman Sheets, John Yossi, and those were the, those were the people that were just involved with the ones that I made. But kudos to those guys. Uh, questions? So my first question is, what about testing sub-assemblies by putting them in a factory-made game, just that sub-assembly, if it's plug-compatible? Uh, I suppose, you know, I suppose that could be done. 
okay, if, uh, you know, uh, you know, why not? Uh, but that has not been your practice. Yeah, it's usually yeah, it's usually a little bit of running around. Then I would rather you know I would rather test. I test it all. One of the guys he asked me one time. He says, "Hey, well, I, what happens when you flip these things on? Does everything just work?" And I said, "You know, most of the time, yeah, because during all during the all during the build, I'm testing. I, I, when I'm finished with the switch switches, I'll test all the switches. When I'm done with the lamps, I'll test all the lamps." I'll test all the solenoids. So I'm testing all the way along, and at the end, uh, everything kind of fires up, you know. I'm not end, ending up with uh, 50 problems that I have to take care of at the end, you know. Uh, yet, <clears throat> do you like playing pinball? <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as my son attests to, I'm a lot better at building them than I am at playing them. <laughs> a lot better. Martin, you have a question? I just wondered um, how the price compares after you sorted all the parts, got all the, you know, the, the new play fields and cabinets of a Wally made game compared to a remake of that same title? Um, you know, I, I tell everybody that it's, I think it's possible, and I think I've been doing it for five or $6,000 per machine. But I spend a year looking for parts, and I restore a lot of used parts, and I look for deals at the pinball shows like we have right here. And, you know, if you want, if you want all brand new parts, and you want them tomorrow, you can easily double that. Or, you know, I, I know some guys that are building machines, and they buy parts just when they need them. And if you, if you add that up, you can spend 25% of the total cost of a project on shipping, you know, if, you, if you're constantly having parts shipped to you. So I don't know if that answers your question. You know, Martin was at, at my pinball uh, Expo seminar in 2012, and I brought the medieval madness that I built. And one of the somebody was asking, "Do they play the same?" And I said, "Well, you know, they're, you know, my measure, you know, I measure everything as carefully as I can, but they could be off a little bit." So Martin played my medieval madness, and he goes, "Hey, well, you made that left, that left loop shot a lot tighter than the original." I said, "Yeah, it's off just a little bit." Yeah, so that one's a little bit tighter. So. Experienced people will will see slight differences like that because it's a lot of handmade parts. I want to follow up on that uh, costing question. Yes. Uh, you also have a lot of tools like all the the, the bending brake and yeah. things that most people don't have in their home shop. Uh, do you have any comments about uh, use of a maker space to get at some of those kinds of tools? No, I, you know, Dave, I, I've never done that either, but I've heard people really saying that that's a really a good way to go, that they have all this space available with all the tools and everything. But you know what? A lot of my tools are kind of kind of cheap tools. You know, the Harbor Freight brakes, you know, they're, they weren't really that expensive. So uh, I, I wanted to mention, too, about the sheet metal, you know, about bending parts and everything. I never built, I never bent any metal before in my life before building these pins. There's a, a really steep learning curve that you go through. You bend a couple pieces, mess up a couple, and it, it, it's e it gets to be easy at the end. Have you ever built an older EM? No, I have not. Is that a plausible project? Uh, or is it more difficult? You know, I, I really never gave it any thought, but, you know, it might be more difficult. It might be more difficult to source those parts than a, well, a, WP, a WPC a pen. Might be. I do have a surf champ, though, at home. Um, this is also a pricing question. Um, you said, I think, on average, they're around, like, 5000 in cost and everything. Yeah. Um, what would be, like... A like the cheapest that you've ever made something? Well, you know what? 
um, probably attack from Mars. Attack from Mars would probably be the least expensive one. Uh, just because of the, uh, it seems like it has a, maybe a little fewer mechanisms and uh, uh, it might fall in the lower end of that spectrum, you know, around closer to the five rather than to the six. But AFM was uh, probably the simplest and probably the least expensive, I would say. Here's a question for you that people probably ask, but you haven't mentioned. You've given a price, how much it is in parts, and then also how many hours that you've put into it. Yeah. Of Let's say someone wanted to hire you to make a copy. <laughs> that would be a different price. Yeah. So and, and, and you know what? I, 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 I wouldn't. I really wouldn't do that. Uh, these, these are all pinball machines that I built like one-offs you know, for my own use. I don't sell any. And I, I'm just a big fan of pinball, so I don't think I would ever uh, do that for a living or whatever. How do you decide which uh, machine you want to do uh, or what would your next one be? Do you start with, hey, I got a motherboard or I have a, uh, a ROM or, or what was your, you know, choice? Well, I usually, uh, I usually build pinball machines that I like to play. So those are, that would be the first considera consideration. And, <clears throat> you know, I've, I started to collect parts for Indiana Jones. Uh, Indiana Jones was the roughest one most unavailable parts. <coughs> so if I saw a part at a show like this, then, you know, I would buy it, you know, and put it in, you know, for future reference. And then as other machines, as I found parts for those more readily, I would build those next. I don't know if they'd answer the question right, but it's the games that I like. Those are the ones that I built. And a lot of times it would depend on if I could find parts for it that would determine the sequence of building. Last hey. call. Hey, Wally, speaking of um, the left loop on Medieval Madness, <laughs> it's a great day for jousting. <laughs> um, no, I, honestly, so I saw a lot of color DMDs in the picture, so I imagine that's what you went with on, on some of your builds. But speakers didn't come up. And I know um, upgrading speakers on a lot of machines, some of the speakers that they used back then were not of the finest quality. So what, what was your uh, go-to on, on speakers? Well, and, and a lot of the, thanks, Paul. And a, a lot of the speaker systems, I would, I would take out the, the fact, I wouldn't go with the, the factory speakers. But I think I would just go with regular Kenwood speakers or whatever I could find that were reasonable, you know. Um, Twenty, thirty dollar speakers, whatever. Sure, and then um, <clears throat> you mentioned a lot of splicing and and uh, daisy chaining and whatnot. But <clears throat> how many um, alligator clips would you say you used on on any given build? I hate alligator clips. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bo is one of the uh, guys from the neighborhood, and whenever I go by his house and pop open a machine to work on or whatever, and I see an alligator clip from a mod, so we got we're taking it off. And I'm soldering that thing, and and so we got a big box of alligator clips if anybody needs it. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.